to say that we we are just uh, waiting a couple of more minutes before we start uh, while people are, are actually uh, being entered into 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 the uh, the webinar Hi, Mark. Let's let, let's begin now. Um, so let me start by saying welcome to everyone from across several time zones, um, known faces, new faces to this agrarian change webinar organized by the General Agrarian Change and the Department of Development Studies at SOAS University of London. I'm Jens Lerge from SOAS and from the Journal of Agrarian Change, and I will be chairing the session. I'm also joined by two General Agrarian Change co-organizers, Shreya Sinha from Queen Mary University of London and Enrique Castagnon from UCL. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Ray Bush of the University of Leeds as our speaker. Ray is Professor Emeritus in African Studies and Development Politics. His many other positions and activities include his long-term membership of the editorial working group of ROPE, the Review of uh, African Political Economy, He's also on the International Advisory Board of the Journal of the Grand Change, and is a founding member of TIMA, the, the Beirut-based research collective on agrarian environment and, and labor in the Arab world. He's published widely, including a paper hot off the press in the Journal of Agrarian Change related to, to today's topic, and the contribution on feasible utopias in the likewise recent Handbook of Critical Agrarian Studies, edited by Akram Dodi, Dietz Engels, and, and, and Mackey. His own books include the 2019 volume, Food Insecurity and Revolution in the Middle East and North Africa, co-authored with Habib Ayer. Today, Ray will talk on a topic and a country he has worked and published on over many years, Egypt on issues relating to land, land politics and farmers. The title of his presentation is Egypt's Agricultural Transformation, Farming Without Farmers. I'll leave it to Ray to take it from there. All that's left for me to say before that is to remind you that the webinar is also live streamed on our YouTube channel and you can post comments and questions in the live chat both at the YouTube channel and, uh, and on the Zoom here. Also, we're recording the session. If you don't wish to be recorded, simply don't use your audio and video. And if you can, and you can find the full program of our webinar and seminar series on our website, Agrarian Questions. With that, let's start today's program. Ray, over to you for the next 15 minutes. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Jens. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Uh, thank you also to, to Jonathan Paddington, who was the editor of the Journal of Agrarian Change, who encouraged me against my, my wishes at the time to publish the piece that you 
advertised uh, land and small farmer resistance in authoritarian Egypt, which is now published by JYC. Um, he encouraged me to, to, to write it, uh, then wasn't entirely happy with what I wrote, and then encouraged me to do something else, which was great, because actually what I ended up doing was something I felt um, a lot happy about. Whether you will feel happy with what I'm about to say, though, is something that you'll no doubt let me know at the end of uh, the, the presentation. Let's uh, move this forward. I want to try and do um, four interrelated things. Um, and uh, this, this is not um, necessarily easy because what I want to try and do is raise some broad questions about studying of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, how one um, understands uh, land and its, uh, and its politi politicization and um, what role small farmers and small scale family farmers have played in Egypt's political economy and why they have been so um, ignored. Um, the fourth point, I guess I'll probably push to you or at the end because it's about possibilities for alternatives which as you'll probably gather from what I have to say, currently don't look particularly um, opportune. What I'm gonna argue um, is that there is a, a persistent a recurrent theme of modernization theory um, underpinning, knowingly or not, what it is that the policymakers in the government of Egypt and the IFIs, the international financial institutions um, promote. And in that context, uh, there is also a recurrent persistent resistance by small farmers to the varied outcomes of economic reform, liberalization, and the attempts by the IFIs to deploy effectively modernization view of, of um, development. And in this context, of course, in Egypt, there has been a quite ferocious um, consolidation of military power. Um, repression at home, crony land allocations with um, imperialist support. Now the region of course is one of, of food import dependence. I think that's one a, a theme that most people would understand but of course it's one of immense contrast, contrast between political economies in the Gulf and, uh, and in Yemen and of course a large economy but a also rather poor economy in Egypt. And we'll, we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. It's a region that's been characterized by a negative food trade balance, um, a particularly um, arid region, yet um, high levels of citrus and fruit vegetable exports. The World Bank argues, and the government of Egypt has certainly argued that the problem with agriculture in Egypt is that it's, it's um, often uh, beset by drought, the poor soils, and just too many people, overpopulation of small scale um, farmers. Um, that kind of characterization, it seems to me, has to be set within a policy and historical relationship um, with the world economy. A world economy that has generated um, poor consumption levels, mounting foreign debt, uh, trade imbalances, um, immense land inequalities, and overall, therefore, an economy that's highly extroverted, directed to the world economy rather than possibilities for generating and promoting more sustainable local national um, <coughs> economic development. Having said that, I think um, we also know that food exports per se don't mean or don't necessarily equate with um, economic dependency. Um, economic dependency is a result of a particular configuration of an internal disarticulation that makes commodity exports a manifestation of underdevelopment. But this is something that Max Isle uh, and I and Habib will, I hope, shortly publish in, a, in another paper on, um, on the region. Um, just to remind you of some recent and perhaps not so, not so recent historical past, it, it seems to me that whilst the countries have different histories in the region, and we're gonna focus on Egypt, of course, in a moment, there are similar themes and themes which um, require often 
uh, reconsideration and a persistent recall to see how and why the historical past <clears throat> informs um, not only our understanding, but the actual character of the political economies um, in the region uh, and in Egypt. And I'm going to focus on, of course, the period um, from 70 onwards, the, the end of a period of, of uh, developmentalism, if you like, um, and the process of an accelerated land reform that is active to increasingly dispossess and marginalize small scale um, farmers. The contemporary period, and you'll see the periods overlap, of course, and that's the, that's the whole point, it seems to me, of understanding uh, the long durée of historical um, world historical sociology. Um, the current period is one that's really been shaped by um, a neoliberalism in Egypt. It's often seen to date from 1991 with the World Bank Structural Adjustment Program. In Egypt, actually, and somewhat unusually, neoliberalism as a kind of set of ideologies um, emerges sooner in the countryside in 1987. And that's, um, I think, an interesting um, observation to, to reflect on further. The current period also is, is noteworthy for the end of um, the planning institutions, which in Egypt had been so, if, so important during the uh, 50s and late 50s and, and 60s. And it also character, is characterized by what I think has been probably what the most significant counter-revolution to the Nasserist period, and that's Law 96 of 1992, and the shift in land tenure and economic security, which I will talk a lot about um, in a moment. So what I'm going to what I'm going to uh, argue is that Egyptian agrarian transformations have been shaped by shifts in the relationships between the core and the periphery, um, and this accounts for moves towards uh, capital intensive agriculture. It accounts for um, export oriented agriculture and uh, in increased import uh, dependence, especially after 1987 in, in Egypt. And it's done under the, under the guise of comparative advantage. Egypt's a natural greenhouse. Take advantage of sometimes uh, three um, cropping seasons uh, per annum. Um, you can already, if you have the stamina, to reflect on some of the COP literature upcoming in Sham in a couple of weeks' time, you can already see in what the World Bank is saying about Egypt and COP that they are revisiting um, the ideas of the significance of trying to revitalize supply chains, uh, invest in climate resilience and water use efficiency, let's have a good dose of smart agriculture, then Egypt's agricultural transformation will become much more um, improved and significant. And there is constantly the, re the, the repeat that there are too many small producers, that there's a need for the private sector to promote food security and build uh, capacity. Build capacity and food security for whom? Um, and how? Um, and with what kinds of consequences? These are questions that uh, aren't raised much in the um, policy debate. Now, you can't talk about Egypt without having a map, um, partly because it, and I don't want to give too much or concede too much to the um, uh, environmental determinists, but there is a certain reality of the narrow belt of agriculture highlighted either side of the Nile in green on this, on this map. The cultivable area being around five, probably a bit more than that now, 6% of the total area. And the presence of 30% um, of the labor force, which is um, 4 million peasant farmers, small scale peasant farmers but significantly farming um, less than around two acres. So a high concentration of small scale uh, farmers. The brown areas on this map, the new reclaimed projects are slightly old. They're much more extensive now in the Western New Valley than the Southwest, uh, also in the Northwest uh, and, and at the, north, um, the Northeast. Now, the food security debate in Egypt is hinged around raising revenue 
to purchase food on international markets, not to become self-sufficient. That's been moderated a little bit with the conflict in Ukraine. But the debate about food security is engage with the international market, engage with trade for food and benefit from that. And the um, rationale for that is that small scale farming is actually highly um, productive um, and high yields, um, but yet very still dependent on importing 50% of the country's food needs. Um, more than 17% of the import bill is for food products. You compare that with a country like India, which only uh, accounts for about 3% of, of the import bill. Brazil, I think, is around 8%. Uh, these are significant differences, points of, of um, divergence. 90% of farmers on 50% of the area. Farming, you know, about half a hectare. 3% account for 33% of the total agricultural area. Um, and an average uh, in excess of 10, 10 uh, 11 um, hectares. There's been a move of increased social differentiation, as you, one would expect perhaps, with the modernization of uh, small scale holdings increasing, farm size small falling for those holders, and um, a fall in uh, women registered heads of household. That is particularly significant in relation to Law 96, which I'll say a bit more about in a moment. Um, I think these slides are going to be available afterwards. I, I'm very happy to, to, to uh, send them to anybody who, who wants them if they send me an email. So I don't want to de delay too much on, on the actual um, detail of that uh, numbers of land holdings. The IFIs and the government of Egypt have promoted repeatedly the idea of a comparative advantage. Um, and yet when one looks at the value of food exports uh, a couple of years ago, around 4 billion US dollars, this um, is only just under <laughs> the government of Egypt's food subsidy bill, <laughs> food subsidy for um, especially bread, but also for um, oil and other, other grains. They know, we know that the grain market upon which the Egypt is so dependent is um, controlled by the so-called ABCD of uh, grain merchants, uh, Archer, uh, Bunge, Cargill, and uh, Louis Dreyfus, companies which to this day remain probably the most secretive merchants um, on, any, on, on any scale. Um, it's interesting that small farmers, you know, there used to be a rhetoric, uh, even amongst critical uh, agrarian scholars, that small farmers don't feed the world. Um, well, actually, uh, small farmers, I'm going to assert, do feed the world, <laughs> and small farmers in Egypt are producing 50% uh, of the country's um, cereals. Uh, they've now been asked, since the conflict um, in Ukraine, to uh, supply 60% of their outputs um, to the state. You can see quite a heavy dependence upon Ukrainian exports, Russia, uh, up until a couple of years ago, was was supplying 60% of Egypt's um, grain. There's a double whammy because of the conflict in Ukraine and, and Russia, because um, Ukrainians <coughs> Ukrainians and Russians like to go to Egypt for tourism. So that's also hit the um, foreign exchange opportunities for, for the state. On top of these uh, import dependence upon grain and the vulnerabilities of the international market uh, therein. Uh, there's also, of course, the concern about the climate emergency, irrigation challenges in Egypt, already salination, um, especially on the northern coast, rising sea levels in northern Egypt and the northern part of the delta already experiencing high levels of salination and um, water logging. But why does Egypt um, become grain import dependent? Well, there are three recurrent themes that um, persist in uh, providing us with explanations for that. Uh, the first is the issue of economic reform from 87 um, and continuing with um, economic liberalization and the help in so doing by USAID. 
is a character of the global and, and regional food regime um, with gulf investment in areas of land reclamation um, that the Egyptian state is advancing. And there is a regime accumulation centered around, but not exclusively, the military and local elites um, that are continuing to dispossess and marginalize smallholder um, farmers. And the context within which these three big themes, generating food, grain import dependence, are, is, are taking place, is the repeated rhetoric by the regime that food import dependency needs to be reduced. Um, there will be support for, although it's not much evident, boosting small farmer production. There is a need constantly to relieve demographic pressure in the Delta, and in so doing, increase and improve opportunities for land reclamation, and then resettlement of Delta farmers. And there's a need to boost direct foreign investment in order to help that magic formula become delivered. It's important to reflect on the historical trajectory of Egypt's agrarian transformation. Um, the period of Nasser and developmentalism was a period of seeking to curb large landowners. And with particularly two reforms in 52 and 61, there was an attempt to curb the power of large landowners. Before the reforms, 65% of the land was owned by 5%, 6% landowners. After the reforms, there was a uh, reduction in the possibility for individuals to hold land. There was a, a reduction in rents, security and tenure for tenants in perpetuity. And around a seventh of the arable land was, was redistributed. As you can tell though already, this was only a partial success. Compensation was paid, private property was safeguarded, a very small amount of the total cultivated area was redistributed to a very small number of total households. We know that a turning point in the, the uh, Nasserist period was the uh, defeat by Israel in 67. The opportunities that then emerged from that defeat for Anwar Sadat to promote an accelerated denasserization, which also took place around land and farming and farmers. A delegitimization of anti-Zionism and anti-imperialism. So that was rewarded with support by the United States for increased food imports. There was an agricultural modernization, if you like, along the lines of the US farm model of tractorization of capital intensive production of increased higher levels of fertilizer application, um, which um, didn't work out quite so well for Sadat in relation to boosting domestic food security, because the increased price opportunity, the, the attempt to put the price of bread up led to food riots in 77, so that's assassinated as we know by Islamists in 81. And there is a, a for the, pretty much for the first time, a focus that you know, capital intensive agriculture was generating opportunities for highly productive small farmers. Um, I think what Tony Weiss called the kind of chemicalization of production. And yet the persistent exclusion of, of small farmers from politics, increased immiseration, surplus extracted from the countryside and Egypt's poverty rate greater than the um, global poverty rate. So there was a acceleration of social differentiation with economic reform. This um, was, it was extended in the 90s. It was extended by the erstwhile president Mubarak and his, um, his deputy and the head of the National Democratic Party, Yusuf Wali, who um, accelerated land dispossessions, justified by a neoliberal trope that basically underperformance of agriculture, high dependence upon food imports was due to excessive state intervention. And US imperialism pushed 
uh, Mubarak for a liberalization of agriculture through USAID, large programs in the 90s, as well as and in addition to the military aid, which we can see from 78 has now reached uh, the giddy heights of 50 billion US dollars. And for a short time, economic reform in the 90s boosted cultivated land, wheat production, but those successes were short-lived. And they were short-lived as reforms slashed subsidies for small farmers, um, reduced opportunities for small farmers to have access to credit, other inputs like seeds and fertilizers. And the turning point for me is Law 96 of 1992, which revoked NASA's rights to land for tenants in perpetuity. It ended rental guarantees, it ended farmer security, it pushed farmers, if at all, onto annual contracts, mostly post 97, Law 92 of 96, rather confusingly had a five year transition period. So it didn't formally get enacted until 97, but in that transition period, farmers who had rights in perpetuity to the land, guaranteed tenancies, guaranteed rental costs were completely um, undercut by a liberalization that raised rents sometimes by four, 500% in uh, the very productive um, Delta. The five-year transition program was not without farmer protest. Although there was these, these, uh, this level and scale of protest was not actively reported by the press. And in addition to direct uh, violence against farmers protesting the need to continue access to their land, there were also a series of demonstrations, blocking of rail and highways, which again were often met with brutal um, repression. Now, I'll say a little bit about the um, farmer um, mobilizations at the time of the uprising in 2011, but to reflect on the toppling of Morsi by the coup and the initial popular protest in 2013, Maha Abdurrahman very um, accurately, it seems to me, reflected that the coup was driven by a series of capitalist interests which um, could not tolerate the persistent uh, and unrelenting revolutionary process. And it was a revolutionary process which began to generate internal enemies, internal enemies that the state could um, use to provide justification for its violence. And it's, it's very interesting that Hisham Shalam has just recently authored a book called um, Classless Politics, which he, and, and in that he reflects on the ways in which from NASA onwards, there have been different historical moments of creating um, internal enemies to justify positions adopted and advanced by um, the state. And uh, the attacks on Islamists that led to the horrendous um, slaughter um, in two camps in 2013, in many ways, of course, has continued into um, the contemporary period. The demonization of Islamists provided ammunition for uh, imperial support after 2013. Solidarity before that with Mubarak in terms of the war on terror, an increase in arms sales, um, increased incorporation of the Egyptian state into uh, the finite financial capital and the increase in foreign debt to Egypt, which I think very worryingly is not a debt to the increasingly the bilateral lenders, the, um, the IMF, the World Bank, but to foreign private lenders with the consequences that that has for um, leverage that financial actors are playing in, in the Egyptian um, economy. 
the, the violence and the turn towards repression that CC has generated has led to, um, of course, a constricting of opportunity for rural protest. Um, and we have been reminded by CC on a number of different occasions that um, authoritarian governance is something that is required in Egypt and uh, some of its most brutal dimensions, including the tremendous increase in capital punishment that's took place since 2014, CC has declared as being part of, quote, our humanity. Between 97 and 2000, during the, the acceleration of economic reform and liberalization, almost a million farmers were dispossessed. That's a quarter of the farming population. This politicization of land has been accelerated with the um, position of uh, Sisi and positioning himself as a populist. He has taken the criticism that Mubarak faced of corrupt land sales to a new level. Now almost, <coughs> it's now the case that almost a third of Egypt's cultivated land is classified as new land, reclaimed land. In Toshka, Al Salam Canal, East Owenat, and in the New Valley. Many of the projects without any adequate environmental assessments. Heavily subsidized uh, export subsidy programs around wheat and maize, and with significant Gulf investment. The rhetoric continues to be boost food self-sufficiency, employ labor from the overpopulated Delta, but without the results that are declared at the onset of the large scale land reclamation projects. Uh, if you take one case um, west of Aswan, there has been um, an allocation of land uh, in an area about 250,000, uh, about 250,000 acres, 50% of the land allocated on the scheme has gone to the military, 50% to the Gulf investors. Um, and here, this idea of the corporate food system and the regime linked to Egyptian capital with Gulf finance is very important. If one looks at a company like uh, the, the Sevola Investment Group, for example, who proudly declare that they believe in doing business the balanced way, Saudi and Gulf investments since 79 have mushroomed in Egypt um, and controlling uh, wholesale and retail outlets from bakeries through from growing of food to uh, selling it in, in retail outlets. And, and I must say to my surprise, and I don't think I'm easily surprised last week, I see that uh, uh, the, um, the state uh, and the UNDP has the, the UNDP has formulated a memorandum of understanding with Savola to encourage it to uh, promote and deliver the sustainable development goals. Um, the export strategy has been mired in uh, problems of rewarding commercial farmers, and it's interesting that that term commercial farmer is deployed rather than farmer per se, to distinguish the large investors from small scale farmers. Egypt's future, which is the program launched by CC, is ignoring small scale farmers. It's promoting Gulf investment in land um, without um, farmers. Now, the reward to um, if we if if the, the first theme that I just raised is the land reclamation and the investment from the Gulf, um, there's another process whereby local land reclaimed is being grabbed from below. This grabbing from below is a term Sakar El Noor has has advanced in a case study of um, Upper Egypt, where he sees instead of foreign agribusiness seizing land, um, it's a process, of, a process of domestic land grabbing has emerged, where local elites, the petty bourgeois without farming access, but with income to purchase land, is using and holding land for speculation. 
not for farming. Um, but he also advances the idea that farmers have resisted um, land grabs and they've done it by protesting and taking using the prism of protesting the absence of effective or efficient service provision. So al Noor and others have argued that effectively from the turn of the millennium, farmers have been very actively involved in not just struggles over land and irrigation and land access, but over water, its cost, its quality, and um, the way in which water is allocated and um, distributed. Now in 2011, it's something Habib Ayyub and I tried to demonstrate in the book on, on, on Egypt and Tunisia. Farmers were involved and built on the struggles that took place in law 96 and 92 in the uprisings of 2011. And um, those protests um, did for a short time take the form of direct action and self-organizing and seizing land that they had been dispossessed of in the earlier Mubarak years. Reem Saad has argued that this kind of um, farmer protest is protest not just about water, farming and agriculture, but it's about housing, infrastructure, transport, roads. And she has argued that there was an extension after 2011 of citizens-based projects citizen-based protests, creating what I'd argued in another, in a piece um, after 2011 of networks of resistance, where farmers worked alongside and were informed by links with either NGOs, legal organizations, and in sometimes trade union, informal trade union mobilizations that took place at the time of the 2011 um, uprisings. Here I'm suggesting that the success of farmer protest is very often linked to the strength of the local state, the proximity to urban centres of working class descent. So at the time of the uh, uprisings in 2011 and the immense mobilisation, working class mobilisation in Mahala, a textile centre uh, north of Cairo, which is the which actually has the greatest concentration of industrial workers of anywhere in the in the Middle East. Um, there were, there were clear indications that farmers were showing solidarity with and learning from organized labor from within the textile um, plants. The interesting question here, it, it seems to me, and one that um, needs further reflection is, how does one explore the spatial dynamic of protest in this context? In the context where modernization doesn't create separate urban and rural spaces. But there are, and in Egypt, it's clear that there is this expansion of agro towns and urban villages. How do we in this context problematize the idea of uh, rurality? Farmers know the cost of open protest. So the resistance is often voiced in terms of cultural values of sanctity of life, death, honor, um, and justice. It doesn't mean to say that there aren't strikes, sit-ins, roadblocks, um, and close links with advocacy groups like the Land Centre for Human Rights, which emerged in Cairo from, from 1996. In Egypt, often forms of organisation are led through syndicates, but the syndicates in, uh, in, the farming, in farming and agriculture have very seldom been um, significant in, in mobilizing local farmers. And one of the reasons for that was that the, 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 the leftist party, the Tagama party, um, at the time of law 96 of 92, split many of which who had advocated for farmer syndicates to support those being dispossessed, argued instead that the market should take a role in managing that pattern of dispossession. So at a time of a possibility where one of the left, one of the significant historical leftist organizations could have driven a, a much more active engagement with farmers, 
um, there was um, it, there was a failure to align with those being um, dispossessed. So I suppose the question really is, is there a dynamic of resistance to the contemporary regime that's generating a class consciousness? And, and what are the dynamics of inequality and access to land that has been more violently imposed since 2014, where there's an, where there's an absence of effective syndicate representation and where the state has to approve syndicate registration anyway. So there's a tendency for those petitioning for particular syndicates to be complicit with what it is that the state um, wants in the first place. There is, I suppose, if, if one's looking for glimmers of hope, then it is necessary to, to, to say that in, in, in September 19, the regime was shocked by street protest. It was a street protest that took the form of opposition to the regime and, and uh, allegations of, of um, corruption. And the large scale protest, which involved farmers, um, did lead to a reinstatement of food subsidies that were, <laughs> were being reviewed after a November 2016 IMF protest. There is also another round of recent protests that I think is significant. And this is a series of protests against a piece of legislation that is trying to establish a reconciliation payment made by owners or occupants of particular buildings that may have been built illegally on agricultural land. This is a piece of legislation that you would think is at one level completely um, innocuous, but it's a piece of legislation that's taken a long time to draft. Um, we do need to understand that, you know, 168,000 hectares have been converted from agricultural use to buildings since the 80s. So the state has argued that this is an attempt to regularize uh, and to re reduce and restrict agricultural land being used for urban development. The critique of that, of course, is that the CC regime is characterized as a regime of construction engineers, the corporate military wanting to regularize and generate income from historic buildings and dwellings built by over many generations of, uh, of Egyptian um, farmers. Such was the anger which appeared on demonstrations not only in September 19, but also in September 2020, the so-called Friday of anger, that Sisi was driven to say that if you're not, if you don't like the idea of reconciliation, I'm ready to leave. Let's do a referendum and have somebody else come and ruin Egypt. This was, in terms of a public declaration, something that he had never ever uh, breached, broached um, before. So, small farmer protests have been persistent. It's been against neoliberalism since the uh, mid to late 80s. It's galvanized around law 96 and around the buildings violations um, reconciliation law. There is recurrent, repeated, violent repression. There have been networks of resistance that have been broad based and linked to service provision and the persistent politicization of land. I would assert that there is a class consciousness of farmers as heightened by struggles for services and autonomy in the context, as van der Plerg has argued, in the context of dependency and processes of exploitation and marginality. I've also asserted that we need to situate smallholder farmers in the context of households, agrarian transformation in the broader context of the historiography of imperialism, and highlight the links between international national and local processes of capital accumulation, class formation, and household social reproduction. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Ray. What a, what a tour de force through a, a, a terrifying development that you have highlighted here. Maybe the, the in a sense, the, the, the core of the story is known. The, the, the neoliberal food regimes, the corporate food regimes 
uh, what it does to small farmers, but the but the extreme version we see here is, is certainly very interesting. And so we we will now open for a discussion, uh, question answers, comments from everyone participating here and anyone who are online as well. Uh, you can either we prefer if if you would speak up simply by raising your your hands in the system and and we will get to you you can also raise questions in the chat that we will we will bring to raise attention as we as as we progress but let me pick off the discussion here very briefly just by raising a, a couple of points that hopefully can, can, can get us going. I mean, as I said, I mean, this is this is clearly a, 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 I mean, it's 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 a very interesting story about large scale corporate uh, agriculture and how that is up against uh, 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 the small farmers and and uh, ruthlessly up against small small farmers driven by state policies that actively has changed its allegiance from small farmers to uh, large-scale corporate investors, including the military. Um, so clear political shift. Now, so, so to me, that raises a couple of questions. The first one is, how do the small farmers then actually survive? What do they do? I mean, they, 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 their, their lands average below two acres. Is that enough to survive without proper capital, amounts of capital to, to invest? Are they still farmers, or are they straddling the? Uh, are the households themselves straddling the rural-urban divide by members of the household working in in urban centres, etc.? Uh, I think that matters also for how to understand um, uh, the, the class consciousness Ray, that that you were mentioning. Is the class consciousness as farmers? Or is it a class consciousness as oppressed in many spheres? And is there is it a difference worth talking about? Yeah. And linked to that, what sort of I thought what you said about alliances was really interesting. That 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 you said there were at least cases of alliances between farmers and uh, uh, other movements, NGOs, and also uh, unions. Now, uh, how do you see those alliances? Are, are they so? So, what what was conspicuous was that you didn't highlight alliances between small farmers and big farmers, between uh, large scale capital and small farmers. So, so the alliances, if I understand you correctly, the way you see them is simply between small farmers and non agricultural groups. Now, that, of course, is a slightly different um, perception of alliances to what, for example, Via Campesina would, would propose. They would focus on the alliances between all, uh, between the, the, within the different kinds of, of peasants belonging to different classes, isn't it? So how does this perspective, how does that sit with views such as Henry Bernstein's classes of labor? Which exactly argue that that today's uh, alliances and similarities, class-based alliances and similarities, go uh, across all all exploited populations in agriculture and outside. And finally, and you don't have to answer all these questions at once. Finally, uh, 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 it would be interesting to hear your reflections on how you see this in relation to classic discussions around uh, the agrarian question, the idea that uh, agriculture should produce enough surplus to enable industrial development, and, and at the same time, that industrial development would produce jobs for, for the rural population that was being squeezed out uh, of agriculture. That is clearly not what's happening here. So what do you think one can learn from, from well, it, would it be interesting to learn from, from Egypt in relation to those classic discussions. Um, I can see there are already a, a number of questions also in the in the chat, but if you want to pick up a, a couple of, of these questions here first to, 
to then then we will uh, move on to other questions and return to anything later that that might be of interest. Thanks. Yeah, well, <clears throat> thanks for giving me the opportunity to come back to some of them. <laughs> <laughs> rather than have to try and think and deal with all of them now <laughs> because there were some uh, there were some very interesting and important uh, questions there and I imagine some of them will be picked up by others actually um I think the um the issue you raise about um survival is is absolutely crucial um because there is the assumption that well peasants would always manage um, they, the, the elastic is infinitely stretchable and that kind of language and discourse is, is quite common um, in, in Egypt um, as, as well as um, elsewhere. I think classically um, what has happened is, well, two things. I said that perhaps as many as a million farmers have, a million farmers were dispossessed after Law 96 and 92. Uh, soon after, but also during the five-year transition period um, between um, 92 and 97. And um, it's been not always straightforward to try and pick up. Um, obviously, there was no research done by the state on what was happening to those farmers. And in fact, the state didn't know how many tenants there were. So they enacted a piece of legislation that was directly going to hit a million tenants. Um, without understanding um, what was going to happen to them and their livelihoods. Uh, and what did happen, of course, is that many became landless and migrated and added to uh, an urban um, uh, unemployed or uh, very kind of precarious labour. Others were engaged um, as workers, as laborers for others. So there was a process of labor hire in. And I think this idea of the kind of the complex web of tenancy and rural holdings is, is important because it's not just a question of land ownership and working, working for yourself as a, within the family or for others. It's also working as sharecroppers and working in the, the local town as well as migrating further afield, uh, both within Egypt uh, and beyond. So this important term pluriactivity is one that's very much deployed um, in analysing what it is that farmers do and how they manage to do it after dispossession or marginality. I mean, during the 90s and early noughties, Nada Figani, who was the lead editor for the Egyptian Human Development Report, basically argued that 80% um, of um, Egyptians were living on less than two dollars a day, um, which made them poorer than Zimbabweans at the time. Uh, and I have to say that's an analogy many Egyptians would uh, not be very happy with uh, for all the off sometimes racist characterizations of so doing. So um, immense, immense levels of impoverishment and hardship, uh, pluriactivity and opportunities to try and find um, labor opportunities within the countryside. Um, and outside. And of course, it added to this idea of what you've um, really alluded to and this kind of straddling of the rural and the urban. Um, and in looking at kind of labor migrant economies in Southern Africa, I mean, Lionel Cliff and I many years ago used the term peasant area, uh, which I think would make people like Henry Bernstein and others run a mile with. But the peasant area was one that we thought captured this <laughs> rather um, difficult um, theoretical uh, idea of well, what happens to not just a physical geographical location of a person, but also their class consciousness and their understanding of well-being. And I think that idea that you raise of, of class consciousness of those who are either dispossessed or working elsewhere, do they adopt or advocate for working class interests? And if they do, are they different from interests of farmers. And of course, classically they are if it increases the cost of cost of food and inputs into the um, urban wage bill. But I think what I would, you know, if if one if if in this conversation we get to the idea or the discussion of alternatives, then I think one of those alternatives has got to be the um, re 
reduction in the income inequalities between the, the, the rural and the urban. Uh, and in so doing, try and reduce um, rather than accelerate the, the class differences between um, uh, the um, rural, the, the peasant um, and the worker. So the, the alliances that I've referred to, I think you're, you're right, these are alliances and the networks of resistance that emerged both before and after 2011 were with, with kind of middle class, often legal organizations, advocates, those advocating on behalf of rural dwellers broadly defined. Um, the, the Land Center for Human Rights, for example, which emerged after 96, was an organization which repeatedly got hit by the state, re, re, um, hit uh, offices, searched uh, workers, um, arrested and they developed ways of working with farmers that were really quite uh, canny. Uh, they um, often, and I was, I was party to this as well, instead of going to the, going to villages to interview farmers, farmers were brought, <laughs> farmers were brought to the land center's office in Cairo and conversations and, and, and group discussions took place there rather than jeopardizing or raising flags that um, who, is this, who are these people going into to villages. So I think I mean, for the minute, I don't wanna leave it, leave it there, but I think this issue of, of how effectively what you're, what you're raising, but you're raising it through these, these questions that are formulated historically as agrarian questions, what you're what you're raising is what I asked what I what I suggested at the end of the conversation, which is how do we understand rurality? How do we understand it in the context where there is massive urban sprawl, where there isn't a uh, there is increasingly less a permanent working class. There is instead not just precar precarity, but there is flux and movement and mobility inside and out. And under those conditions, how does one organize and mobilize for political alternatives? Thanks, that was very well put. I think that is a problem many of us are grappling with in our research areas, as well as of course, activists on the ground actually trying to do it. Let us move on to, to the next question. Questioner, Carla, please, you are next. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Ray, for for your talk. I was one. I was uh, wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on the um, on the um, yeah on the characteristics of the local these local elites that are um, uh, linked to farming. I, I didn't understand well if and how they are. Um, uh, linked to agricultural activities, and if so, which would be their um, relationship to larger corporations as the uh, biggest grain traders. And the other thing, uh, because here in Argentina, the uh, the trend that you spoke about of um, um, raising um, export outputs and uh, raising food prices has a long story, so I would like to know if that is possible. A little bit more on uh, which is the what explains the uh, the ri ri rise of increase in food prices. Thanks. So we normally ask the the the, the speaker to to uh, come back on the question straight away uh, okay. so and get proper proper answer. So over to you, Ray. Okay. Uh, the, um, the issue of local elites, um, and, and forgive me for not being being clear when I when I when I raised it at the end. I mean, what I was highlighting was a distinction between the large scale land reclamation projects that were um, party to significant levels of Gulf investment, and uh, those which were identified as geographical spaces for land reclamation, but where uh, 
local elites were in, well, people were invited to bid auction for land, as well as those who were um, seen as nominally um, smallholder farmers to purchase or engage with uh, new opportunities for accessing land. But as Sakar al-Nur highlighted in his case study of a scheme in Upper Egypt, he argued that basically small farmers did not have the wherewithal to purchase or access, and that in fact, local elites were buying land, which effectively was state land. Local elites were buying land, and in so doing, they were holding it for speculative purposes, not for farming. So the rhetoric of the scheme was to invest in um, opportunities for providing employment and boosting agricultural production. In fact, employment wasn't improving and neither was agricultural production. So there were two types of schemes, those that were subject to the large scale investors from in big investors and local elites who were effectively buying up or accessing land. And this had also happened after law 96 and 97 when landlords um, failed to provide contracts for farmers um, insisted on um, effectively the growing, well, farmers insisted increasingly on growing cash crops because they hadn't the security or knowledge that they would be on the farm for um, very long. They had no guarantee that they would be there for more than a, more than a, a, a 12 month period. And in the process, um, land owners were generating significant increases in rental returns because of the release of, um, of, of prices. I'm, I'm not sure, Carla, the, 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 the question relating to food prices, other than to say that the, um, the suppression of food, the suppression of grain after um, or during the, during the kind of second food regime was the one of US dominance and the provision of PL 480, public law 480 grain for um, export to the global south, which generated um, strategies for, um, I suppose, wheat imports and disarticulated agrarian transitions, if I can put it like that. The grain crisis in 2008 was one that we know highlighted this spike in prices at the time that increase in the prices in 2008 which was the forerunner to death in bread queues in Egypt which led to the uprisings in 2011 the the, the, the forerunner to that price the, the explanation at the time of 2008 price increases was oh an increased opportunity and liquidity for Russia and China to purchase grain on, on international market. We know that actually the longer term trend around grain prices was this was the way in which grain had become increasingly the product of a financialization through the merchants, which managed and created the conditions for the increase in grain and its reduction in the supply on international markets. Thank you, Ray. Um, now, we do have, I think, three detailed questions in, in the chat. We will return to them in a, in a moment. Let's just take the first, uh, let's just take the next two uh, um, uh, speakers here or, or questioners here on uh, uh, that we have waiting. The first is Leo. Thank, thanks a lot. Ray, that was um, that was completely um, fascinating. I I want to um, press you, if I can, a little bit on alternatives. And you mentioned you mentioned that I think in in one of your comments. But I I wonder what shape that alternative takes. You you spoke about NASA's reforms, but you're hesitant about them as well. That they were partial that they didn't take on 
vested interests in in the way that could have brought about a fundamental transformation in terms of land holding and rural and urban change in Egypt. Now, the process of those neoliberal reforms that you describe, triggering, of course, in part, the huge popular protests. I wonder whether you could explore a little bit more about how in the huge protest movements that have taken place, there were the seeds, perhaps, of some sort of counter hegemonic alternative that would drive forward a, a program of um, national self-development, or as Amin, um, Sami Amin described, the sovereign national project, and whether that's a model powered with the agency of the poor, the working class, and um, the peasants themselves, and those terms intentionally um, and necessarily inter interlinked. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Ray, uh, over to you to answer that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah well, thank, uh, <laughs> thanks very much, Leah. Um, the, uh, everybody's had their Weedabix today, that's quite clear. Uh, um, I think you know, Nasser's, there's a whole debate about um, Nasser's intentions and outcomes and um, they are for me in a sense and forgive me being um, facetious characterized by a joke that was prevalent at the time and that is um, if you were walking on Catherine Neal Bridge in downtown Cairo you were picked up if you had a beard because you were an Islamist and you were picked up if you were clean shaven because you were a Marxist and this absence of a class politics in Nasser and NASA's um, strategy to promote um, anything other than the kind of a, the outcome of corporatist strategy. Uh, famously, uh, NASA would say to organize a, to demonstrations of farmers, um, you know, you've, you've, you basically, you know, I caricature it, but you've had your land reform um, in return when I want you, you'll come to Midan Tahrir and um, you'll demonstrate on my behalf. And, and for me. This is a kind of a corporatist um, uh, alliance, which um, worked very well for, for, for many years and did give an improvement in farmers' uh, well-being. Absolutely, no question. Um, and But it's not just being churlish to say that it was partial. Here was a moment and an opportunity to smash the power of landlords and to revoke the political clout that they had his inability to do so led to immediately in 1970 after his death, Anwar Sadat to promote the desequestration of land that Nasser had put in place for reform. And it led to, from 1970 onwards, the ways in which those who were dispossessed to reclaim land that they were no longer formally and legally entitled to. And it led to landowners even laying claim to after law 96 or 92, religiously endowed land, again, which they had no locus standing in order to, to access. So yes, NASA was great, in quotes, but also a failure to draw a line under the power of, of landlords as a class project um, led to the possibility for their persistent uh, recurrence and obstacles. Now, was there a moment after 2011, Leo, where there was a count possibilities for a counter -hegemon hegemonic alternative. Certainly not Samir's, I mean, uh, national sovereign national project, absolutely not. But there was a uh, moment in the drafting of the second, con second constitution in 2014, where there, was where there was immense optimism amongst um, advocates for food sovereignty because there was the insertion into the 14 constitution of a food sovereignty clause. And that created, well, it's in law, it's in con constitution, therefore we can rally around it. Um, that was the advocacy view. Um, the outcome of course, as we know, has been a period of increased uh, and accelerated 
dispossession and marginalization of, of, of farmers. An alternative, it seems to me, has to be privileged on the basis of understanding the need to valorize peasant farming. Attack me for being a peasant populist, no problem. Valorizing peasant farming and agriculture is the only way in which an alternative strategy where land as a collective resource rather than a private asset can deliver an alternative that is meaningful and sustainable and in the contemporary climate emergency, deliverable. Because any strategy which continues to seek to build upon industrial farming <laughs> as a important building block for the next uh, period of our lives, it seems to me is, um, is misled. Egypt, host of COP27, has revealed last week that in their national planning, they won't meet um, zero targets until 2050. Um, there's no attempt to think about um, coming along, coming alongside or aligning with the discussion that took place um, in Glasgow last year. I mean, I think the, the alternatives, when I, when I say about valorizing peasant farming, it is about um, ultimately, of course, developing a sovereign national project that manage, manages to ensure that local production is not subsumed under the international law of value. That ultimately is what the alternative would have to be um, um, based upon. And there would, as I alluded to earlier, have to be a reduction in the differentials between urban and, and farmer um, incomes. There has to be an increase in the possibility for local demand, purchasing power. Um, and when I reflect back on a billion, a billion dollars as part of economic reform of the agricultural sector since 87, and what a billion dollars could have developed could have led to these are is we have to as academics and activists we have to ask and pose the counterfactual it's not just it's not an, oh well if this and not that no if there was a billion dollars at hand now to transform smallholder farming in egypt then we would create the conditions for valorizing peasant farming improving improving rural conditions of existence no question but it's the the, the strategy declared and the policy enacted was to favor large-scale farming within the context of modernization. Uh, thanks, Leo. Can I, can I just misuse my, my status as, as the chair uh, yeah. and, and, and put to you, Ray, um, a point made by another speaker of ours, Raman Kumar from India, uh, when we talked about uh, Indian agricultural development. He said, well, there's no way small farming in India can survive without government support. Yes. It has to survive. It can only survive through government support. So yeah. the idea that it has to be uh, to, to 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 be able to be profitable on present day market basis is wrong. I just wonder what, what, what you think of that. Absolutely. I mean, there has to be. I mean, the 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 premise of an alternative. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. For us to talk about alternatives, we can be fanciful. This is what we'd like. What is possible and deliverable in a context of a very violent authoritarian state that has done all that it can since 2013-14 to marginalize and minimize the benefits for small farmers is of course <laughs> moot. There has to be, however, therefore, a strategy that's built around what's possible as well as what's deliverable and what the social forces can, can, can generate. There was optimism in 2014 with the new constitution, food sovereignty which we know in other social formations, especially in South America, is the platform around which uh, alternatives are driven. There is a debate also around agroecology, linked very much to food sovereignty. Um, but that, that debate, and it did take place, interestingly, it took place also at the time of NASA with is Ismail Sabri Abdullah, who was a planning minister who hired Samir Amin to work with him alongside, I mean, I for many years, I would make an annual pilgrimage to see Ismail Sabri Abdullah, who was a very 
you know, an amazing figure within the planning um, sector on, on Egypt before he's before he's he's marginalised. But that was a for him. It was also about using local techniques for irrigation, um, as well as with, with another Egyptian, uh, Fauzi Mansour, who um, who um, who uh, Max Ayel has, has has written about it at length. So the part of the alternative is also about using local initiatives, local knowledge production, which is part of, you know, um, a uh, an important dimension, not just of Western commentators and I self criticism here. It's about the, the 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 platforms for alternatives laid by people like Sabri Abdullah, the Muhammad Atif Kish, for example, sadly now passed an agro an agro economist at um, environmentalist at the University of Minya had been petitioning the Mubarak government for God's sake put in place an environmental assessment program for Toshka and other land reclamation schemes completely marginalized uh, in the process but these activists and academics were we can return to to learn the lessons of the recent historical past. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to Mkopi. Uh, All right. Um, thank you very much. My name is Mkopi Mbani from the University of Johannesburg. Um, thanks for this fascinating uh, presentation. And um, from where I stand, uh, together with some of my colleagues who are based in Bolivia, uh, Brazil, Canada, uh, Vietnam and Zimbabwe, um, we see some parallels with what is going on in Egypt with the rest of the global south, particularly places that have recent land reforms where capital tends to resuscitate itself uh, to regain the land that has been lost uh, through, through land reform. Uh, we are seeing, we are actually studying this in Bolivia, Brazil, Canada, uh, Vietnam, and to uh, some extent in, in Zimbabwe. And um, it, it's fascinating um, that you mention the role of the state in facilitating these processes of, of uh, counter agrarian reform. And also the concept of um, grabbing from below yeah. is also um, appealing uh, uh, to, to grasp uh, state preferred emerging commercial farms uh, that yeah. seem also to be used uh, to block processes of, of agrarian of agrarian reform and also the, the promotion of of import of exports as justifications for snail pace or even reversals of of land reform and also i want to end with um, um just to talk briefly about um, similarities between egypt uh, tenants and the, the the labor tenants on south african farms um, there are about 10,000 land claims lodged by labor tenants, which are currently uh, relatively frozen and not moving forward. And uh, they too, as the tenants in Egypt, are referred to as backward farmers. So um, I really um, agree with you when you uh, say that uh, small scale farming should be valorized. Um, and um, I think uh, Yen's point is on point when he says that cannot happen without state, state subsidies on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a massive scale. So yeah, thanks for the great presentation. I would like to end it there. Thank you. Uh, 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 well, Thanks very much. I mean, I'll say thank you very much because um, the comparative observations that you make are um, ab absolutely um, crucial.
uh, and I like very much that, that that term that you used of the state preferred emer emerging farmer, uh, because um, it's quite clear that, you know, in Southern Africa, of course, there's always been this idea of the, the, the small farmer and the, and the commercial farmer, and the commercial farmer was always kind of bolstered by the racialized uh, uh, regimes. I think what what the thing that is I would also pick up on is this the, the, the discourse, the discourse that farmers, small farmers are backward. Um, it's, it's not just that size matters, it's that mentality is also shaping a particular worldview that that the modern world doesn't need to have and should should push to the should push to the back somehow. I'm reminded by um, Reem Saad, who, who who wrote a fascinating treatment of how the parliament in Egypt discussed and debated in as much as there was active debate, the law 96 of 92, which effectively, you know, took the land away from tenants in the sense of, of relinquishing any rights in perpetuity for, for holders. And she comments how there was a debate about farmers being, um, of course, uh, of course, backward, but also lazy. Um, and it's part of that laziness, which was the lament uh, highlighting how poor the Egyptian farming system was. And there was a whole diatribe in the Majlis um, where the parliamentarians were talking about um, young farming communities spending their time in local cafes watching pornographic films. It was as if this was the character that somehow the, the, the parliament in debate could use to usher in a legislation that was going to modernize that group and somehow incentivize them to no longer spend their time uh, drinking tea and coffee uh, and otherwise amusing themselves. Thanks, Ray. So we will now turn to the questions in the chat and Dina, we, we, we haven't forgotten you, we'll go, go to you afterwards, but first uh, we'll just ask um, Shreya, will you, will you uh, uh, give Ray the questions? From yeah, the yeah I, will. I will. Thanks, Jens. So, um, so Tom Lavers is asking uh, that, uh, well, he, he said that your talk did not mention uh, one of the biggest changes coming on the Nile, which is Ethiopia's GERD. I suppose that's the dam, the Renaissance Dam. Um, and I was wondering if you could give your thoughts on how this is influencing Egyptian politics domestically and in turn the government's negotiating position with Ethiopia. And uh, in particular, I mean, there is a cause for concern about potential water shortages because uh, the GRD will the dam will fill up and this and the Sudanese will in have increased usage for irrigation. So how does this play into the government's approach to agricultural development and the relative support for small and commercial farmers? Um, so that's one. Then there's a question from Julia who is asking that I wanted to ask about the reduction in registrations by households headed by women. Uh, you briefly mentioned it was linked to law 96 of 92, but um, yeah, could you just explain what the drivers are for this change? Uh, and then we have a question from Lucy who is asking, um, as you've mentioned, the government of Egypt has been using policy measures for decades to relieve population pressure on the green belt along the Nile, um, and on the other hand, to encourage a move towards more intensive and export-oriented production practices. Uh, so, of course, these things have affected different types of farmers differently, creating competition over land and resources, uh, which were then exacerbated by climate change. So what is what are your thoughts on the future of small-scale farming and pastoralism against these intersecting challenges? Um, there's one more question, but I can we can come back to it, Jens, or you can take it later. Let's Let's take that afterwards. It's been, yeah. I think three, three is enough yeah. for an hour. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Now the, the 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 question of the Renaissance Dam, of course, is uh, something that has vexed uh, the Egyptian state, uh, not just now as the dam fills, but for many years prior to now. Uh, 
um, the um, ministry that would you would imagine would be um, most relevant for this, the Ministry of Agriculture and Land Reclamation, was denied any uh, observations on the dam. This is an issue for the President's Office uh, and the Foreign Ministry. This is an issue of national security. And the Egyptian state has um, raised issues around national security directly with the Ethiopians. And of course, they have at different times threatened the possibility of a of a of an escalated uh, armed conflict. The fear is that the dam will slow the um, volume of water, not just reduce it, but slow the volume. And um, it would have consequences both in Sudan and in the filling of the of Lake Nasser, which would then slow the flow of water from Upper Egypt to the Delta, thereby um, reducing and um, reducing access to irrigation and also um, perhaps if flows are reduced to have environmental consequences on salination and um, and otherwise. So the, Ethiop the Egyptians have declared that their, um, the Nile Waters Agreement of 56, I think I'm correct in thinking it's 56 rather than 55, is the agreement that um, continues to pertain to access to the water, to access to Nile water. What the Egyptians don't say is that the Egyptians have been taking far more water annually uh, than the Nile Waters Agreement ever um, so gave them. So um, there is a very heated debate about access volumes uh, and otherwise. Um, if, if the Egyptian state is to be believed, then the consequences are gonna be calamitous. If the Ethiopians are to be believed, the consequences will not be as bad as the state is saying. I, don't, I can't say anything um, more than that, and, I'm, and I apologize if I can't um, give a, anything more definitive. Um, the issue of women-headed households is interesting because, um, and it does stem to back to Law 96 and 92, because at that time, um, landowners seemed to um, deny um, renewal of contracts to uh, women-headed households. And it wasn't, it wasn't exactly clear why, other than issues of, of patriarchy and, and prejudice, because um, certainly the women that uh, me and others interviewed at the time um, had a very clear financial wherewithal to continue to pay even the grossly inflated rents um, and were reliable uh, engaged farmers often hiring in uh, labor outside of the household. So it wasn't clear, um, but the evidence from uh, not just the enactment uh, after 97, that five year transition period, but also subsequent agricultural surveys um, has shown a decline in um, women headed um, households as, as farming. And um, wasn't for financial reasons um, at the time of, of the change. I should say that access to reliable data in Egypt, uh, not just in Egypt, but the Middle East more generally, is very problematic. Uh, this is a point that Ali Kadri, in that fascinating book, um, Arab Development Denied, has, has highlighted. Um, and uh, certainly gender sp specific analysis um, in terms of the, I mean, the 2000, 2010 agricultural census still hasn't been published. Um, figures are available from um, authors around the uh, authors based in the FAO in Cairo, but not in terms of the formal um, publication of of um, the census. What is the future of small scale farming? Um, well, the trajectory is for small farmers to be increasingly immiserate, immiserated and marginalised through an active policy of objection. An objection here is a term I deploy because it's not just about poverty that results from the change and shifts in policy, but objection is an active pushing aside. Objection is an active policy. You, um, it's not just about the unintended consequences of policy. Uh, this is a declared policy to uh, reduce the numbers of, of, of small farmers. And um, the, the CC government, 
um, has learned its lessons from the way in which the 2011 Mubarak regime was toppled. And for the moment, there is very little political space for social mobilization that could create a social mobilization that would advocate for and defend smallholder farming. Thanks, Ray. Uh, let us go to Dina. Hi, thank you so much. That was very um, refreshing and insightful. I guess my question is a little bit in connection to COP27, the fact that we're nine days away from this event. And I think some of the key discourses that are um, being framed for COP27 and how those can be leveraged rather than to close opportunities for um, connection with the agricultural conversation Egypt. One of the things that I've been thinking about and wondering about is the loss and damage conversation in particular, and the way that's sort of being framed in the international community to talk about you know, irreversible changes, particularly to rural and smallholder communities, um, frontline communities, and so on. Um, and I know from my research that, you know, five years ago, for instance, when this, before the subject sort of became Rosen's political salience the way it's risen now, I remember asking this question in government circles and the loss and damage conversation for them is so risky and dangerous because of the, it's direct connection to the question of land and land tenure and land ownership in Egypt. And I think, you know, when we're talking about especially Delta communities that may have to be dealing with the consequences of climate change. Um, I, I'm curious, to, basically, the question I'm trying to ask is where you see opportunities for international networks of solidarity to support framing and bringing these issues to the fore that allow connecting the political realities on the ground, the sort of political ecological realities on the ground with some of the openings and conversations and narratives that exist at international level, if those opportunities exist. And the reason I also ask this is because I think it's quite interesting that last month, for instance, um, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa had a meeting that had no Egyptian organizations present. And, you know, they're trying to present and push for an agroecology response that centers smallholder farmers and that they're, they're very much focused on this also from an angle of sort of climate adaptation, loss and damage and impact but no Egyptian organizations came to this meeting. Part of this was because it was held in Addis and part of it was a visa situation for um, Egyptian organizations, but part of it is probably a reflection of the realities for civic space in Egypt. So uh, essentially, how do we use this moment so that it opens up spaces, um, if that's possible? So before you answer, Ray, and thanks, Dina, uh, let me just uh, read parts of, of the last question we have so far uh, in the chat from, from Dio, because it's, it's, it's sort of related. And, and the question asked here is, how do you see then the upcoming COP27 meeting looking specifically to Egypt? Is there anything Egyptian farmers can expect from this global event, apart from pledges and promises uh, that do not take seriously? that do not seriously tackle the root causes of, of Egypt's inequality, starting from the huge role of the army, which has an impact on local farmers, fishing, etc. But basically, what can be, is there anything good that can come from COP27 is, is the knob of, the, of, of that question. And I, so, sorry, Dina, for putting it in here as well, but it sort of, in this, it, it's in a broad sense in the same area. Well, I mean, the, the they're great questions, and <laughs> um, if only I could have an answer in the real world that would deliver something that was really positive. Um, I think there are two dimensions to this. One is the complicity by the donors, IFIs, um, with the government of Egypt and its authoritarian agenda, and the way in which COP is being organized, um, and already, uh, Egyptians in Cairo are having their phones checked to see messages in relation that may be linked to um, protest of around COP. Um, and already in the first day of the COP, the Egyptian state has said there are going to be too many heads of state present for there to be NGOs available in one of the big pavilions. So therefore, they won't be allowed in on the first day. 
So if you're an NGO and you want to be present on the first day, then you've got to invite a head of state to be present in your pavilion. If you can grab one, um, then you can um, be present. Um, it, 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 I, I'm not saying it's, it's tiresome, but you can you can just see how the criticism of the Egyptian state and COP and um, and the authoritarianism that's going to shape um, the COP debate from Egypt and the failure of the Egyptian government to engage actively with an agenda that would deliver something that could build on even the pitiful outcome of the Glasgow COP. Um, it's so easy to hit the Egyptian government, but we should also hit the COP process itself, which is hierarchical, colonially imposed, and, and driven by northern interests that are quite different from those in the south. We have to move beyond the nonsense that we all live in one planet, um, and we're going to suffer the global warming, okay, but some people are going to suffer that global warming more than others, and they just happen to be in the global south rather than uh, in the north. The idea of loss and damage, I mean, what an agenda. Um, and what an important agenda for um, for Egypt for reparations that go beyond just simply debt relief. This is an agenda that has to be advanced. That international solidarity is about not just debt write-off, but it's about compensation and reparations. Absolutely, and it has to be non-reciprocal trade arrangements that disadvantage the North over the beneficiaries in the South. Absolutely. But these are agendas of, a, of an activist uh, having a few drinks rather than the realities that will be delivered uh, on the ground at any COP, um, frankly. It is interesting that for my sins, I recently um, reviewed a whole raft of um, literature by the IFIs on environmental degradation in, in North Africa, the Maghreb. And uh, apart from inducing narcolepsy, this was a very worrying series of documents because they do invoke modernization. They do invoke um, the preference for industry, even in the teeth of environmental costs and challenges of sea warming and the consequences of that. There is, of course, always the possibility for international solidarity, but you know, I'll, I'll share with you, you know, I've, I've recently invited several people to try and write something for the Review of African Political Economy from Egypt, mindful that let's have no names and authorship, absolutely, but I would like the Review of African Political Economy to present perspectives from Egypt on at COP and it's so far not proved very easy to do. Um, so Dina, I invite you, I don't know where you are and I'm very happy to meet you for the first time, but on this hot date of ours, I'm inviting you to um, submit something for us perhaps um, and mail me afterwards so we can have a, have a, have a discussion. Uh, forgive me for being so, uh, <laughs> commercial in my <laughs> entrepreneurial not commercial entrepreneurial but I um you know yes yes to international solidarity and yes to loss and damage in reparations and absolutely this is the agenda that has to be advanced can it be advanced in in Egypt yes human rights organizations the EIPR uh peasant solidarity committee which is basically a committee of one or two comrades who have against the odds work with and solidarity alongside small farmers in the Delta. Um, no hope with the, the established farming syndicates. No hope whatsoever. Don't, don't even uh, raise that as, as, as an issue because of their complicity with the state. But the, gra the gradual, mo gradual mobilisation by activists of NGOs, of, of, of people on the ground, of legal advisors, these do, they do eat into the agenda that, that Dina and the other uh, colleague raised. Uh, I can't, didn't take her name. So not optimistic about COP27 at all. All the literature building up to COP27 is around this nonsense of adaptation and um, uh, 
greater efficiency rather than a dramatic gestalt or social transformation that is required if we are not all to be imperiled by global warming. Thanks, Ray. And, and I don't think we should finish on that uh, dismal note. How realistic <laughs> it is. We, we, we've only got five minutes left, so, so we are practically finishing now. I could easily put another question to you. I think that, that there's so much that's worth discussing still. But, but I think the, the, the best thing is to ask you, Ray, is there anything that, that, that you'd like to say as a last concluding point, um, drawing from the discussion or anything else, really? I suppose, I mean, fabulous questions. Um, again, you know, I, you know, on in the, I agonized over drafting this talk tonight, agonized over it um, in a way that uh, I don't know whether that's just a sign of my age or on my existential crisis or whether it's just a symptom of the issues that are raised. But what I think, and what I've stressed is the importance of understanding the structural as well as the conjunctural processes that have been at work and are laid out over decades for us to reach the conclusions that we can begin to edge towards in terms of understanding the contemporary period. So we do need to go back to world food system, the character of imperialism after 45, the way in which the United States has repeatedly intervenes in Egypt. I mean, you know, remember in the 90s and the early 2000s, you couldn't go to the Ministry of Agriculture or Irrigation without bumping into, excuse the caricature, Texan rednecks. The, 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 the ministries were full of American advisors. Extraordinary, extraordinary. And on one occasion, I remember, I had, I had booked a, a meeting to, to talk to one of these guys God help me, um, and I was sober, to meet and talk to this guy. And at the meeting, he said to me, what data have you got? I said, what data have you got? I said, I'm, actually, I'm coming to you to discuss what materials you have and what material you're collecting and why and what the purpose of the policy. Oh, no, we don't have any, we don't have any data. I mean, it was, the, it was the kind of a crass, okay, this is a caricature perhaps. Perhaps I just hit this guy on a bad day. But there was this whole period of the 90s where the USAID were piling in money and advisors into the Egyptian state, knowing that they could work with Mubarak in a process and pattern of liberalization. They said, the USAID said they were not privy to or did not advocate for law 96 or 92. And that interested me a lot because that was the, that's the bellwether for how liberalization um, emerged in Egypt after the 90s and, and into the contemporary period. But they said we, that we wanted to be sensitive, but we just piled in you know, a billion dollars since 87 in economic reform, market reform, the sucking away from any state infrastructure that helped farmers. It, it was interesting for me that you talk to farmers in, in, in for, for many years, farmers would lament the cooperative, they would lament the state intervention, they would lament the failures of the market. Post-reform, they lamented the absence of a cooperative. Where was the cooperative when we, when we needed it? Where was the security and the integrity of the institutions that they had grown up with and been socialized to, through the Nasserist period? Um, and this was the bright reality. This is the new market. If you don't, if you don't match up, then you, you fall. Thank you, even though that was another... Uh, Sorry. <laughs> Don't give me another moment. <laughs> Maybe that is that is the situation we are in. Thanks so much, Ray, for, for, for this presentation. And thanks to everyone for making this uh, very vibrant discussion today. Uh, yeah. I, before we finish, let me say uh, our next Agrarian Change Seminar is next week, same time, where we have something similar but different, of course. Uh, ocean and land grabbing in Ghana's offshore petro petroleum industry from the agrarian question to the question of industrialization. And that is by Jasper Elasuno uh, uh, and uh, Jesse Oviedo. Uh, 
and uh, well, we will circulate announcements uh, for that very soon. Uh, but for today, thanks so much, Ray. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and this is a bit, it's not a good thing to do on Zoom, but... <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Um, Hi, Ray. Just to remind you, I, I already sent you the Zoom link, but of course, oh, you can okay. take 10 minutes.